let's continue talking about goal-directed design and the goal-directed design process. So we've talked about not only last class, but throughout the semester, how important it is to understand your users and understand what their goals are, to be able to differentiate between goals and tasks, and to really start the design process at the very beginning of creation of your product. It needs to be in the beginning of the life cycle. Now, sometimes students will ask me, okay, well, what's the life cycle? How many of you have heard of the, a, a life cycle when it comes to software development? One person, two people. All right, I'm not surprised. What you're gonna find when you go out into industry is that there is something that's called a life cycle, just like kind of we have a life cycle. In software development, there is also a life cycle where you have various phases. And you're gonna be going through these phases. Now, in reality, a lot of uh, what's going on in industry is you have iterative phases, which just means that you are going through the same phase over and over and over again, where you basically decide what you're going to do from various ways. You may do some research. It may be based on feedback that you get from users. It may be if you're developing a new product, going out and researching about what's already out there and those sorts of things. Then you develop a plan. You may engage your users, develop prototypes. You, then you do coding. Then you, then you do testing. Or actually, these days, preferably, that they like doing testing and coding in conjunction with each other. Then you essentially go and do, for example, an alpha and a beta, and then you, you, you go ahead and make those changes, you roll it out, then you support it, and as you're supporting it, now you are starting that whole process over again. So that was the quick and dirty. Now, it just so happens that when it comes to goal-directed design, the process, again, is very similar. These are the general phases that you're going to see. And in fact, when you go into industry, when you look at a lot of project management that you're going to encounter once you're out there, you're going to find that it's going to be very, very similar to this. It's going to be very parallel. They may or may not use the exact terminology, but you want to be familiar with it because you are going to have to work with some sort of project management, whether it's waterfall, whether it's agile, whether it's lean, whether it's customized for a company. So you do want to be familiar with it. So I want to go through these phases very, very quickly so that you get a good sense and a good understanding of them. Keeping in mind that there are people who spend years and years and years, not just studying this in school, but once they finish school, they go out and they get years of training to get certified. So I'm just giving you a flavor. So here are the phases of goal-directed design. Research, modeling, requirements, framework, refinement, and support. So let's talk about each of those very quickly. First, there's the research phase. And actually, most students have a pretty good understanding of, in general, what we mean by the research phase. Because when you're in school, you have to write research papers and those sorts of things. So you're basically going out and gathering information. In goal-directed design, you're specifically going out to obtain qualitative data about potential or actual users of the product. You are conducting research to find out about your users. And we are looking for qualitative data, which has data that tends to be very rich in detail. So that includes things like ethnographic, ethnographic field study techniques. This is where you may just observe your users. Or you may do something called a contextual interview, which we'll talk more about later in the semester which is essentially it's a combination between observing how your users interact with a product and then asking them questions. Competitive product audits. That's basically going out and seeing what else is out there. What is my competition going to be? What do they do well? What do they not do well? What is it that I would need to do to improve this product so that it is a viable product in this domain? You need to make a comparison with what's already out there. Because the fact is, if you duplicate something that's already out there, how well do you think your product's going to be? Probably not so much. If it's a duplicate, how are you going to get market share? How are you going to get people to buy it? Reviews of market research, technology white papers, and brand strategy. Now, a lot of times people look at that and they're like, I thought we were talking about, you know, like usability and stuff like that. So what do I care about market research? 
Well, in fact, market research, although it is not the same as user experience research, can help inform you in the design process. And you do want to make sure that you look at your market research information as part of the design process. It's not going to tell you about the specific goals of users, but it is going to tell you something about your users and what the domain is about, what the domain is like that you are trying to create your product for. Now, there are also technology white papers. Does anyone know what those are? You ever heard of technology white papers? No? Well, you find a lot of technology white papers at universities, but also at a lot of the big corporations. So if you go to Google, for example, they actually have a lot of technology white papers that talk specifically about the type of technologies that they have used to implement various products and various capabilities of products. So Google will have a white paper about their, is it their smart car? I can't remember what they call it, the one that drives itself. They'll ha they have actually a whole bunch of technology papers, white papers about that. They're not geared towards lay people, they're geared towards technology people. Microsoft, for example, also has a lot of white papers. So they will have white papers about SQL Server. What are the things they've implemented in SQL Server? What are some of the technologies they've incorporated? As well as some, what are some of the emerging technologies that they've been either working on in production or working on in research? So technology white papers can really have a lot of very valuable information it can help you find out what the state of the art is and what some of the larger cutting edge technology companies are doing with their technologies. There is a drawback though to white papers. Anyone want to take a guess as to what it is, particularly if it is something published by a corporation? Anyone want to guess? Is you going to be more inclined to defend what the product stands for or what um, you know, the benefits of the product might be to the public? That's right. So it's going to focus primarily on their own product and how, it, you know, how you want to use their product, how it can benefit you in some way. So it has essentially some bias. So if you look at databases, for example, right, we have a lot of different databases out there. And every company that has a database is going to tell you their database is the best. Oracle, we're the best. Microsoft, we're the best. So who's the best? The answer is it depends on what you're doing. One thing you have to remember with these white papers is that, for example, when you are doing testing with databases to see what is the most efficient, which is the fastest, they have complete control over the data that they use for those tests. So you do have to take Technology white papers with a critical eye. Keep in mind, it's not just an educational tool for a lot of these corporations. It's also a marketing tool to technology folks. But still, it can have a lot of very valuable information. But again, look at it with a critical eye. Don't just look at what Microsoft has. Look at what Microsoft has. Look at what Yahoo has. Look at what Google has. Look at what various universities have to try to weed out some of that bias. Brand strategy, that's also really important. Think about, again, the iPod. Right? Apple's done a fabulous job with brand strategy. Even look at the most recent uh, iPhones that they came out with. There were a lot of, I don't know if you read, there were a lot of people who were predicting they were going to crash and burn. And do you know what happened instead? They actually sold more than they did the last time. So they are very good at their brand strategy. And if possible, you want to be able to do one-on-one -on -one interviews. Right, with people who are stakeholders, which is anyone who has an important say into how the product should be developed and what it can do. Other developers, what are their experiences? Subject matter experts, people who are experts in that particular domain. Technology experts, particularly if you're dealing with technologies that you may not have been dealing with or seeing what the cutting edge is. So there's a lot of information you're trying to gather to have a better understanding of your users. And what is it that you're trying to do with all of this? Excuse me. Well, you're trying to identify a set of behavior patterns that's going to help you design a better product. So you want identifiable behaviors that can help you categorize modes of use, 
patterns that can help suggest goals and motivations. Because remember, previously in the semester, even though we talk about goals, do you remember what I said? If you ask a user what their goals are, what do they usually tell you? Do you remember? Do they usually tell you what their goals are? No, they usually tell you what tasks are, what their tasks are. So even asking them directly, you need to be very careful with. And it can help create personas, a very, very fun and exciting process that we will get into after the midterm.